who am I? You, you heard pretty much who I am there, but I'll say sort of my shtick in conlanging is I like creating languages for fantasy races, uh, whether they're humans, humanoids, like elves or orcs or goblins or creatures in the, the Dungeons and Dragons universe. And I do this to um, populate different things in my Dungeons and Dragons games so that uh, I, I add a little bit more multi-dimensionality to the game and to the things people are encountering within those games. Um, sometimes it's just a little background flavoring. Sometimes it can inform a, a riddle that the players need to solve. But uh, I enjoy taking things like, how would a, a lizard being speak? And, and what uh, that extra biomechanical um, apparatus from a forked tongue or an elongated oral tract would do, and how can I play with that as a conlanger? Uh, as you heard, I'm the president of the Language Creation Society. Uh, the Language Creation Society started in uh, 2006. Um, it was the brainchild of Sai, who was our former president, um, and they wanted to find a way to get conlangers to be able to congregate uh, in California when, when they were going to school in California and found you could do this better if you had an official club and you could get university money. So the Language Creation Society was born and it's still, become, it's still one of our, our driving principles that Every two years, we have a language creation conference. Uh, we do try to bounce back and forth between the different continents, and we encourage uh, as many conlangers as possible to come out and, and share you know, what they've been doing, what they've learned, any insights they have um, in sort of an academic style conference, but also we have a lot of social engagement so we can get together and talk about the craft and life and things like that. Another major thing that the Language Creation Society does is that we promote constructed language jobs and try to get conlangers fair prices for their work. And uh, we've certainly seen over the last few years that the number of jobs we post have been steadily increasing year over year over year. Whereas back in 2009, when HBO contacted us to say, hey, we need someone to, you know, create Dothraki for Game of Thrones. Uh, I think that was the, the only request we had at that point. And now we're at the point where we're getting 14, 15, 16 job requests every year. Uh, a lot of these are independent or, or first time authors. Um, some of these are like HBO and Amazon Prime Studios. So we're, we're trying to grow ourselves in that way as well. A constructed language is any intentionally created communicative system. So anytime one or more person sits down and says, I'm going to create a way to communicate, that's a conlang. Many conlangers come to this craft by making new writing systems, whether they're just ciphers or codes for English or um, you know, branching out from there a little bit or, or codifying English in a different way. And some of them go uh, as far as creating brand new grammars that don't resemble English in any way, shape or form. But all of that is sort of a, a spectrum of conlanging. It's the intentional creation of a communicative system. So constructed languages are, are akin to natural languages, they have a lot of things in common, and we tend to divide the spectrum up a little bit. Uh, so we can talk about auxiliary languages, and these are languages that are meant to be additional modes of communication internationally. You can leave some of the baggage behind that is your, you know, your cultural baggage, and you can transcend that. So there's, there's no national identity of an Esperantist or someone who uses international sign. Um, art langs are languages created to enhance the believability, or the word I like to use is verisimilitude of a fictional work. So we have uh, Klingon or Natvi, Dothraki, Kryptonian. Uh, this, this list is getting impressively long now with all of the films using constructed languages. 
Engineered languages are languages that are designed for a very specific purpose. Uh, I'll talk briefly about Hungarian Prime and, and Martian uh, coming soon. Um, you know, you might have a language designed to be the smallest vocabulary possible or a language specifically designed to relate your feelings to God. Uh, these are engineered languages, languages engineered for a specific purpose. And although some people might not consider these constructed languages uh, or maybe conline light, you can also have ciphers. So things like wordplay, uh, like pig Latin or cockney rhyming scheme, thieves can't or uh, Lausche Bem was a, uh, a butcher language in France, if I'm, if I'm remembering this correctly, where they would rearrange the syllables in words and they had that sort of coded language where they could talk in secret. And all of these languages, to some degree or another, have something in common with natural languages in that they do have a grammar, they do have a mode of communication, whether it's um, a physical medium through sign language or a spoken language like Dothraki, etc. When people want to begin a conlang, usually the first question they have to ask themselves is who's going to be speaking this language or who's going to be using this language. Um, so if we talk about Natvi, we know that the Natvi are a people uh, on the Avatar world. They're these giant blue aliens that are vaguely human-like and uh, we know they're going to be the speakers of this language. If we're talking about international sign language, we know that the deaf community that doesn't necessarily have an English background uh, is going to be using this as a language for international communication. So of course the grammar has to conform to what the, uh, what the human form can sign. That typically doesn't come to a conlanger's mind is why are you gonna do it? The conlanger decides they're going to do it, whether they have identified a problem or a question or uh, just something fun that they want to try. They already instinctively know why they're going to undertake this process. But it isn't a simple answer. And with hundreds and hundreds of conlangers out there, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of answers to this question. So I broke it down into a, a few broad strokes, and I'm sure I'm gonna miss a few, but you could try to answer a philosophical question. You could try to perfect language. You could try to help cross-cultural communication. So these are the, the auxiliary languages. So Esperanto, uh, created back in the, the 1800s, published in 1905, was designed to give the world a way to communicate that wouldn't have this sort of political baggage that might be uh, tied to your cultural identity. It was supposed to be neutral. And wouldn't it be great if no matter where in the world you went, everyone spoke the same language? Uh, interlingua was quite similar to that, but I think a little more science-minded. So if you went to a science conference anywhere in the world, people would be uh, speaking the same language. And uh, Guosa is an African language uh, meant to unify people from different African nations under one language and, and leave some of the previous history and, and cultural um, upbringings behind them with this, this new unified language. And there are many, many auxiliary languages, either for specific regions or, or globally. You could conline to add verisimilitude or believability to a story. Um, so in the 1970s and 80s, when we start seeing the Star Trek movies come out and people are going, you know, we, we know they have these universal translators, but does the audience have a universal translator to hear Klingons speaking to other Klingons on a Klingon ship? Or would Klingons be speaking a Klingon language? And that, that draws the audience into the story and makes it more real to them. If you go out light years into the galaxy, do you hope that whoever you might encounter found that golden record on, on the Voyager probe and suddenly they speak perfect English? or are they gonna have their own communication system? 
You can conlang for pure artistry or to explore the self. So quite famously, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien had these languages inside of him and he, he called it his secret vice to explore these languages and, and put them on the page. And the resulting stories that we got from the, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and the Cimmerillion, and, uh, these were histories created to make sure the languages survive. The languages weren't invented so that the, the story would be believable. The stories were created to give someone to speak these languages. And uh, I'll talk about Alursa and Itlani uh, a little bit later, but uh, Tony Harris is, is on here today. He's the um, discoverer of Alursa, uh, maybe not its creator because it just, it came to him, I think. Uh, and maybe he'll, he'll tell us a little bit later. And same with uh, Itlani. You, you do not tell Jim Hopkins that uh, Itlan is a con world. It is a world in a realm somewhere real. You could invent a language for language play or for privacy. So you could do something fun with your language and turn it into a game like speaking pin, pig Latin or quite famously many twins um, when they're very young speak their own coded language that no one else in the family speaks. So this twin speak language, which is different between any given set of twins and they have their own, their own privacy as a result. Uh, you could use conlanging to provide a safe space for yourself. Uh, and I will tell you the story of, of Sandic a little bit later on, but if you are trying to keep your thoughts private, uh, simply switching to another language might not be good enough with the advent of uh, Google Translate and things like that. People, people could discover things that you maybe want to keep private, so you could conlang for that reason. Adan was a language designed to embody feminist ideology. Uh, the creator of the Ladan language, um, you know, wanted to promote feminism. And one of the ways she thought she might be able to do that was to create a language that was going to embody these principles where you didn't have masculine first, feminine second. Uh, and part of this, part of what she did to, uh, to get this was she created a system of what we call evidentials. So in order to say a sentence in Laudan, you have to say um, why you believe what you're saying is true. Did you hear someone say it? Do you know it to be true? Do you think it might be true? Uh, things like that. And this was something that the author of Laudan felt embodied a, a feminist point of view, where you not only gave someone a piece of information, but you also gave them how you came by this information. What if Gaelic had become the dominant language in the British Isles? Um, what would our language today sound like? Um, I think we can probably count on two hands the number of words that have entered the English colloquial language from Gaelic. Uh, of course, we have whiskey from Ishkabaha. We have galore, you know, there were sales galore, which is Gaelic for enough. Um, cheers is from the Gaelic slancha. I'm running out of examples already. But if, you know, the Celts had prevailed in the various wars, maybe, um, maybe we would spe be speaking a very different language today. Or you could ask yourself, what if there were a common ancestor between the Basque language and Spanish? What, what would that ancestor look like? And these are all just thought experiments that people could, uh, people could engage in and engage in for the sake of conlanging. Hungarian prime was a language created by a colleague of mine who did her her master's degree here in Calgary with me. And she simplified the Hungarian language. And she wanted to know what is better for learners trying to learn a brand new second language. Is it the sentence position, the relative order of the words in the sentence? Or is it prominence, stress, something in the, the forcefulness of the word? So she simplified Hungarian to try and weed out all of the other acquisition problems that it would have. And she got to what makes a successful conlang. Um, and usually that comes down to speech communities. 
so this is a plaque in Geneva, Switzerland, outside uh, what was the Esperanto Institute, I believe. Uh, Esperanto was created in 1887 and published in 1905, and it's, it's credited as the most widely spoken constructed language. There are more than a thousand native speakers of this language, and depending on how you count or where you look for your information, there could be over two million second language speakers of the language. Esperanto was designed for international communication and for everybody everywhere to learn it. Um, it certainly didn't succeed in making everybody learn it because it doesn't have over 8 billion speakers, but it's, it's typically called one of the most successful conlangs because it has the largest speech community. And then if we contrast that with Klingon, which was originally created as just kind of words on the page in, in 1978, 1979, and then Mark, of course, took it over and, and published the Klingon Dictionary in 1985, Klingon holds the Guinness World Record for the most widely spoken fictional language. And like I was saying earlier, this is probably about 10,000 people. The question is, can we really compare Klingon and Esperanto as being successful or not successful by the size of the speech community? And the answer is again, no. With Esperanto, it was designed to gain a large speech community, and it, it did achieve a large but not total speech community. Klingon wasn't designed to gain a speech community, and I'm going to steal one of Mark's stories here. Uh, he tells the story of watching the Star Trek movie where, where Klingon was featured, and uh, this scene is about an hour and 20 minutes into the movie, and Christopher Lloyd, who is Commander Krug here, picks up the communicator and he says, Mot Jolly Chu. And it's subtitled on the screen for everyone in the audience to, to read and understand what the Klingon means. And an hour and 20 into this movie, people have been hearing Klingon a fair bit uh, here and there in different scenes. But about three minutes later, after Kirk defeats Commander Krug, he picks up the communicator. Uh, the Enterprise has already been destroyed at this point, and the only ship in the in orbit is the Klingon battle cruiser. So he picks up the Klingon communicator with uh, Spock in his arms there, and he says, "Malt, Joe, you And it's not subtitled. And this is a test. Did the audience understand the Klingon? And uh, Mark tells the story of, of watching this and the audience going nuts that Kirk just spoke Klingon. And in that moment, I think we could call Klingon a success. It drew the audience into the film. They understood what was going on. They didn't understand the nuances of Klingon grammar, but they understood at least that line. And from a goal of adding believability or verisimilitude to the film, this means it was a success. And the point I want to make over the next few slides here is we can't just say a conlang is a success or not a success based on the size of its speech community, but we have to measure every conlang in accordance with the goals of its author when they started out. So the next one is Dothraki. In season eight, episode one, we have this wonderful scene where a Dothraki rider comes up to Daenerys and uh, she asks him, and I, I won't pronounce my Dothraki very well here, Finsenyana uh, Ashek, how many today? And Kono uh, says, Akati Dorve Senvath. And we see the subtitles on the screen, how many today? 18 goats, 11 sheep. The, the question was, how many were the dragons eating? Because they, they hadn't been eating. The next day, a fan tweeted David Peterson and he said, was it just me or did the Dothraki dialogue last night not actually say what the caption said? It sounded like it said, Akafe Dorve Vath, which is 12 goats or three lambs, or am I crazy? And David said, oh yeah, sorry, Vaf, you is identical to the accusative version of Vafi, lamb, nice catch, blah, blah, blah. And the guy said, no, 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 no. I was thinking about the numbers. The caption said uh, 18 goats and 11 sheep. And David said, what? They changed it. 
And what the Dothraki person actually said was 12 goats, three sheep, and somewhere in post-production, somebody decided that even for a dragon that doesn't have an appetite, 12 goats and three sheep is not a reasonable amount. It had to be more than that. And the fan responded, that's what I thought too. For a second, I was doubting my in real time translation skills. That means by the time season eight came out, there were people who enjoyed the language so much that they weren't relying on the subtitles on the screen. They actually learned Dothraki and they were able to engage with the show in the original Dothraki. That's incredible. So it's long, you know, way beyond the text, people are engaging with this as a real language. I won't put words in David's mouth, but I, I think that's a fair test to say, yes, this was a successful con way. But let's go away from the movie industry, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a couple of my con lines. Sylvia Sotomayor, who I talked about a little bit earlier, invented Kalen. And this was one of those what if questions, and it's what if there was a language without verbs? And Sylvia said she decided to experiment with a language that didn't have any verbs, where they were something, were they something that was absolutely required by language or just something that's required by human language? Now, there's a few different takes on how successful Sylvia was uh, in her language. There are four, I think they're called linkers or, or transitionals that are kind of verb-like. Uh, oh, no nouns that someone else wrote about. Um, so some people say that, yeah, maybe, okay, she constrained herself to four verbs. Other people agree she created a, a language without verbs. But I, I asked her over email the other day, when did you consider Kaylin a success? And she said it was more of a gradual realization. It may have when she translated a bit from Echo, but translating the Jabberwocky made it undeniable. She managed to create a language without verbs and can say pretty much anything within that limitation. <clears throat> Perhaps the, the hardest impacting story I have ever heard of a Hartlanger actually comes from Aaron Simon, uh, the creator of Sandic. Uh, Aaron is a, a trans person, um, and I, I've pulled out a few quotes that Aaron uses to talk about Sandek. Um, I think something important that Sandek has brought to me is a way to think of myself in a positive light. I had to find a word for myself that didn't have a negative connotation to it. Um, I don't know what that word is in, in Sandek, but it means a person of change. Um, and it's, it's not a negative connotation. So Aaron got to have positivity around, around themselves and, you know, be okay with, with who they are. Uh, the story as Aaron tells it is, um, the, Aaron's father was very interested in going in knowing what was going on in the house. So anything that was written down, he would pick up and read. So Aaron tried to write in German or Spanish or Italian, but all of those things could be Google translated. And finally, he got a little more creative and, and decided he, Aaron was going to create a new language, Sandic, to be able to record his thoughts and, and not have anyone invade his, his privacy. Aaron was not the only conlanger to be interested in sort of this uh, helping or saving or, or providing protection. Uh, Shania here is a conlanger. Um, I believe she is now a doctoral student, maybe a master's student at University of British Columbia. And she invented a language specifically to try and help people cope with uh, trauma or anxiety. And I know you can't really see this picture of her poster. I, I pulled it off of Twitter. But one of the things she says is that conlangs have been used to better communicate, express, and understand specific perspectives and experiences, as well as to facilitate self-healing and encourage a non-stigmatized perception of self. I'm very happy to end there and open it up for questions and discussion.